to everyone for all your kind comments. It's been an incredible 50 years in broadcasting. The places I've been, the people I've met, kings and queens, presidents and film stars, but most importantly, you. Without your friendship and expertise, it would have been impossible to have achieved this award. Thank you to everybody. The northeast of England used to welcome a lot of politicians for various reasons and one of them was Margaret Thatcher who came up and she went to Thornaby. Um, they'd, they'd knocked down the, the derelict building sites that were there and the land was in fact derelict and the press were there and I was doing it for the BBC and she decides to do a walk in the wilderness. So all the press went forward, uh, you know, there was a bit of a scrum but I had my ladders so I just nipped up behind them and got a shot of Maggie Thatcher walking in the wilderness. The shipbuilding was on the Tees, the Weir and the Tyne. The Tyne was mainly devoted to warships and swan hunters. Um, the Tees and the Weir was um, from, for the merchant vessels. And we used to go down and film the ship launches. Anyhow, he ends up in the Forum in Billingham and uh, we, we ended up filming Sergeant Bilko, Phil Silvers. Tell me about the um... Oh, on the road with Lindisfarne, what those lads were like to be on the road with? Well, the, the local group at that point in time in Newcastle was Lindisfarne, and every time they brought a new record out, we used to go and film them, take them out somewhere, and you know, do the thing. We had them on the on the Tyne, fog on the Tyne is all mine, all mine. Um, run for home, and then Luke Casey and the BBC Newcastle took one of them on the road called Troubadour. Should we tell the people about Colonel Spooner's Colonel, time? Colonel Spooner's... No, I don't. Answer. Colonel Spooner's time. We were filming the White Helmets in Germany and we were in Berlin and we were guests of the army and we were given honorary um, officer status. Um, Carl, who was the then doing the sound, didn't have a tie which we had to wear to sort of prove who we were and what we were doing for, to make, dinner. for dinner and make it look smart. Um, Colonel Spooner had this tie was from the parachute regiment. He'd, um, he'd, he'd been in all over the world, he'd jumped out of aircraft, shot a lot of people, done all the things and of course the parachute regiment's tie was one of the highest awards you can get and wear. So Colonel Spooner very kindly loaned it to Carl. So there we are, decide to go for a drink in the middle of Berlin in a beer keller. So there was three or four of us there and it was one of those sort of dark, dingy nightclub type places. That Carl likes. That Carl likes. And then... Supposed to be. No, you can't say that. Yes, I can. And then, and then, and then, I can say that. And then, then he saw the table where we were. I'm so we all, we all, we all, we all waved at him. Oh, well, you put, put it in the archives. Oh, I'll tell the Queen Mother one. That was a good one. Gentlemen of the press, would you like to come over to the drum horse? And I said, Your Majesty, that that would be fantastic. And security was looking at us, and I'm thinking, well, that's a royal command. I'm going, so I whipped the camera off, and I'm off. So we went across to the drum horse, and she stood there, and she said, um, Gentlemen, what would you like me to do? And I said, Your Majesty, if you'd be so kind as to stroke a horse and just talk to the gentleman on there. After a few minutes, uh, that would be fine. So she did that. And I said, Your Majesty, I said, thank you very much. We now have our shots. And she said, Tell me about running around Romania in Patton's Deep with the King of Romania. See, pit heaps have gone and the shipbuilding's gone, which is sad, really, because we, you know, the workforce around the area was extremely good at building warships and, and container vessels. And people still don't believe me when I say that there are still families and communities that don't speak to each other 25 years on from that strike. No, oh, yeah, I mean... And, and to give us an instance, Ellington, Easington. Well, I suppose Easington is the uh, obvious answer. Um, it, it split the communities completely down the middle and even today, in 2014, they don't speak to each other. It's gone through the generations. Your father was a scabby, went back to work and so on and so forth. 
Um, but that's the way it was. I mean, as it's turned out, we shouldn't have lost all the minds. There was a hidden agenda. I mean, you and I went out and we filmed the violence. We also filmed the other side of the coin. That very rarely got on the air, but the violence got on the air. I know I've been petrified. The day we went on the battle, on, on the battle bus with the scab, and then we went down the pit. Oh yes, that was my boss in Newcastle, John Bird. That was the final bit towards the miners' strike. We'd we'd been on the picket lines. We'd sometimes it was quiet till the camera crew turned up. There was the police, and then there was the the miners, and the camera crew turned up, and they wanted to be seen to be thumping each other. And then eventually we got thumped. And then right at the very end, John Bird, my boss of BBC Television Newcastle, his um, his, his pied de resistance was uh, get on the battle bus go through the picket lines, get to the mine head, go down the mine and go to the coal face and film the scabs working. I suppose that was game set and match, but that was the end of the miners strike basically, kind of collapsed after that. They started all going bad. What did that mean for going from film to video? Well, the change in technology was a massive jump from film to, to the first eng cameras um, because there was no massive deadline as we used to have to get the film up to Newcastle, it was instantaneous on tape. Uh, and that released a lot of, I suppose, the pressure, uh, because with, with film, it was really thinking about deadlines, getting it into process in Newcastle, knowing there's another three or four crews uh, filming as well, and you're in a queue. And if it was urgent news story, there's nothing you could do other than process it. When we went into video, well, it just opened an entire new world. It was straight into the studio, straight onto the air, uh, and that was your news story. There was no hanging around waiting for it to be processed. And, I mean, if, if you'd said to me uh, all those years ago when I was in black and white, negative, that one day we'll be able to sort of flick your chip in the air, there's your programme, I wouldn't have believed you. But I've gone through all that 50 years from black and white to a chip is just incredible the technology and of course it changes by the hour really really you'll never keep pace with this in it but it's uh, it's been an incredible journey for technology what did you think of that uh, well it was uh, looking at the past quite unusual <laughs> right, I'll...